And humanity is an evolving idea. Yeah. It always evolves. And if you could be from any background, and you could be from any nationality, any religion, it doesn't matter. But as long as you fully subscribe to the evolving idea of humanity, there is no conflict. Welcome back to another edition of COVID-19 from Crisis to Creation here on Mentory TV. I'm Patricia falco Bekali, your host. Do you sometimes feel some sort of nostalgia, really wanting to go back to the good old days, to the pre-COVID-19 normal? Well, I certainly do. I want to see my family and my friends again without thinking twice about my health. I want to go to the cinema or nightclubbing without feeling restricted in my movements or just unfree. Of course I do. But then I think a bit deeper about the good old days. Were they really the good old days? And was the normal really a good enough normal or could we do better? Think about climate change. Think about poverty, inequality. Uh, also think about anti-Semitism, racism and all these kind of societal issues that have been dragged dragging on for decades, really, and that we might have now a chance to rebuild better, create better. So why not use this crisis, this COVID-19 crisis, as a real moment of creation and rebuild better? So I reached out to Sanjeev Kumar. He's what I would call a modern philosopher. He's an author. He's a poet, apart from being a very successful businessman. Sanjeev, thank you so much for being with us here on Mentory TV today. Pleasure. Really appreciate the time. Really appreciate the time. And hope you're well and hope the family is well. Yes. Yes, we are. Are you? Everything good? Oh, everything good. Everything fantastic. Everything good. You know, we are hoping that by Easter onwards, we will go back to a bit of normalcy, as you were referring to. And I think let's see what the new normal will be. Yeah. You know? Okay. I think, I hope, I hope we will be a bit more caring towards each other. I would hope so. Yes. Well, wait, 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 wait. You're already dashing ahead like a knight in shining armor. <laughs> wait, because um, first of all, I would like to introduce, of course, our viewers that you've written several books. And uh, I love the title, uh, titles of your books as well. Uh, the last one you wrote called The Diary of a Nobody. And you are certainly somebody that is not a nobody, that's for sure. But in this book, you really kind of drew out and philosophized about what I'm our society is right now, whether it is broken and what the humans within our society really are and whether humans are the same thing as humanity. So let's start. And I had to go chapter by chapter, read, trying to structure it a little bit, Sanjay, for our viewers to really get a little bit of a glimpse, a deeper glimpse into your thoughts, really, into you. It's a very personal book. And the society... So you talk in a society that really the people are keeping society together. Tell us, where are we right now with our society? You know, so that's an interesting uh, introspection. And, you know, uh, uh, and I think I'm, an, I'm a learner of nature. So when I look at, you know, the ants, you know, they've been around for hundreds of millions of years and they have a quadrillion population. Uh, and, you know, the way they work in super, <clears throat> super society, super collective, you know, and there is a lot of selfless contribution. So where we are today, I think we are stressed. You know, we are stressed and people are the glue uh, of the society, you know, and the idea that binds people together. And what has happened is you know, we have followed a specific narrative. We have conditioned ourselves on that specific narrative. And we have lived for thousands of years you know, on that narrative or hundreds of years on that narrative. But every idea has its self-life. I mean, not the shelf life, but the self-life. And it, if you don't re renew those ideas, if you don't reinvent those ideas, what happens is it starts to kind of come to a, a limitation. It starts to feel restricted. And I think that's what's happening. Yeah. That's what's happening with the society. Uh you know, people and their thoughts and the narratives. Let, let's uh, pick up on that one. I think that is very interesting because you say people in a society, there is a certain narrative that everybody is kind of voyaging on together. And that is, at the end of the day, what 
glues people together because they think, okay, we are on the same wavelength. So you and I, we can kind of get on, meaning we have some sort of um, equal, good and prosperous society. But narratives change. They change with, with times or not necessarily so. It does change with time. You know, it does change with time. And I'll give you an example. Look, uh, uh, the way U.S. society is changing, the way European and U.K. society is changing. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, we can classify ourselves that, look, there is a liberalism idea, there is a conservative idea, there is a, you know, socialistic idea. But what, what I think, if, if, we can, if we can understand that at the end of the day, they are just ideas. At the end of the day, they are just opinion. And, and what matters is that I should be willing to allow other people to disagree with my opinion, to disagree with my narrative. And I should be open enough to allow other people to kind of put their own point of view. And, and if I'm really learning, I should be able to change my point of view. What happens is the old thinking that, no, no, this guy or this person can change his mind just like that. I think that's, the, that's where the problem lies. I think as you, I mean, as you evolve, we're not the same person we were 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So as we evolve and our journey evolves, we meet people, we learn from people. What? And as we, le- as we learn, our thought process changes. So an idea can never be permanent. The, a, a, the, even the definition of a God cannot be permanent because how we took God uh, 2,000 years ago and how we take on God today is different. I mean, another scientific example, I mean, we are working on defining what life is. So today we need to figure out what is the new definition of life because we are looking for new type of life. So it means we need to go back, go back and then relook and revisit and redefine what is life. So obviously there is change. Let me quickly interrupt the conversation to say thank you that you are here with me on the channel. If you do enjoy what I'm putting out, the in-depth kind of conversations, then why don't you subscribe and also hit the bell button so I can keep you informed with our newest releases. Thanks for that in advance and let's get back to the conversation. Let's start with the first thing you said, Sanjeev, you know, ideas, we should all be able to have ideas and listen to other people, maybe pick up some of some ideas and we should be free in our thoughts. However, thoughts drive actions. So one thing is to have ideas. The other thing is to A, act on it or be dogmatic about it, B. So I think there where the actual thought becomes an action becomes then something that can infringe other people's thoughts and actions, which then makes for an unquiet type of society. Yeah, and this is, this is the situation. So what happened is, uh, you know, we, 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 we think and we are convinced that what we know is the ultimate. Unfortunately, that's the problem that we face. I mean, I can tell you from my own experience. So when you interact and when I have interacted with my friends, uh, they have, they're coming from a, a place where you think that they are not that well informed in that subject matter. But instead of them being willing to admit that they are not well informed in that subject matter, they will, you know, argue with you day in, day out. Uh, and it is no longer a discussion. It's about winning an argument. And if we were having a discussion, we should all be open to learn from each other. And a good discussion is where you and I go disgusting and both come out thinking, well, we've learned something from it. Yes, I am not we have to... evolved, yeah. As you were saying, and I'm not trying to win, win an argument and you're not winning, uh, trying to win that argument. And that is pro- the problem we face in the society. We are all looking to win. Yeah, we're all looking to win the me, myself and I culture. Definitely something. And it's all about the ego and the learning. So are you saying that we actually are evolving on one hand, but at the same time fail mostly to learn from each other? Yes, yeah, so this, is, this, is this is the issue. So... I think we understand where our problems are, you know, and, and sometimes what happens is we start comparing ourselves to other people. And when we think we are not where other people are, we get frustrated and all of our insecurities and inhibition and whatnot starts to play up in our minds and all of that. And then the prejudice starts to build in, the bias starts to build in. 
so the, the, the point I the, the point I make to myself is at the end of the day, you know, where you want to go is dependent on your own journey. So if I or you were to compare ourselves where we are to 10 years ago where we were, that's the right comparison. Mm -hmm. Not me comparing myself with somebody else and not you comparing yourself with somebody else because we are all living our own journey, right? Absolutely. If it is a journey. Now, I think looking back at the hindsight, you can have two looks, Sanjeev, and please disagree with me if I'm talking, <laughs> if I'm talking nonsense. So I look back and I say, ha, huh, I was different 10 years ago. Hmm, what am I now? Or 10 years ago, I kind of thought, where do I want to be in 10 years' time? Who do I want to be in 10 years' time? And I'm not talking about the financial means necessarily or material success. I'm talking as a human being. So you do have, yes, I compare myself, but I can compare myself from a reactive perspective or proactive perspective. You know, so that's a, that's a, that's a long-ended question. And uh, I think the way I can only tell you from my own experience. So we have this habit of looking back and analyzing. We are too analytical. Uh, and unfortunately, we are not very uh, savvy uh, type analytical people. We think we can analyze the situation, but we don't really analyze it. Of course it. we right. can. We know it all. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> so so we, we have that because we think we know everything. And sometimes uh, so there are two sides. So one time, you know, so there on one occasion, we will be analytical and will be self-critical, uh, or there are others who could, you could classify them as narcissistic, et cetera, who feel, well, I've done everything and I'm amazing and we, I, I don't want to go to politics, but we, I think you can understand who I'm referring to. You know, I'm the genius and all of those. No, I cannot. Let, you know, help me out there. Help me out. <laughs> so we'll be, we'll be, we'll be, we'll be. <laughs> A Mr. Powerful, who is, uh, you know... A, a who's won the election, you mean? Who's won the election? <laughs> yes, before the election. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I don't think you get a lot of good self-analysis there. Because any time that type of person will look back, will always say, well, uh, I've always been great. So what happens is, let's say if you and I are doing self-analysis, uh, we either get... Uh, too pessimistic, too self-critical, that, oh my God, I was so stupid, so silly, and all of that, or we are too optimistic about it. So I, I encourage myself not to go into analysis. I always say, look, I did whatever I could to the best of my ability 20 years ago. I did whatever I could to the best of my ability 10 years ago, and today I am doing whatever I can to the best of my ability. Exactly. And exactly with that conscience, I like that, that in the moment you do it, be it 10 years ago, even 20 years ago, that the moment you do something, you say, okay, the best of my ability, not perfect, but progress, but definitely the best I can give right now. And that really brings you closer. Sanjeev, let's get back to the society. First of all, I need to drill a little bit deeper into the concept of society because society is nothing else than a bunch of people with their ideas, of course, and different ideas. And you mentioned before democracy. Let me add also uh, communism into it. In your chapter, Destroying the Society from Within, you are very much comparing communism to the COVID-19 virus, sneaking into a free, liberal, democratic society in, in, in order to make the society sick? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think I, I might upset my friends who, who, who adore the idea of communism, but uh, I, I give them an example of nature, you know. Uh, and I say, I say, you know, nature is not communist at all, you know. Uh, uh, and look, uh, at the end of it, uh, we can't, we have a system that works. I mean, uh, we have a system that works, but it's not working for a lot of people. Uh, but the solution is not going back to an idea that doesn't work. At all. At all. The, the solution is uh, we, need to, we need to create a lot of add-ons, you know, a lot of add-ons that helps the reach of the system that we have created. The, the, the point of view is, the system is not perfect at all. The system doesn't work for 90% of the people. It just doesn't work. So we have to create, continuously keep evolving 
uh, and no one idea is, is, is a permanent idea here. Mm-hmm. So what we need to do is we need to keep a people-centric approach because at the end of the day, pandemic has shown us if you take out people from a society, there is no value in the system, there is no economy. So if it is a people-centric, a genuinely people-centric idea, then it will work. Then what we are looking at. I agree, people-centric, it must be about the uh, the people, but our society is getting more and more diverse, more and more complex, trying to really satisfy as many also minorities as possible. How can you really generate that that common narrative that really is the glue in a society then? You know, a lot of had to come out of honesty. We are not honest with each other. We are not honest with ourselves. That's the reality. You know, so we come to our society, let's say I will come from a society, I'm living in, let's say, the West, but I want my thinking to be here. Well, you know, I can keep trying and pushing, but I'm not being honest with myself. The reason why I came to this part of the world is I wanted to explore more possibilities. I thought this is a better place. I thought this is a better society, right? So, If I am coming to this society and I'm saying, well, no, but I want my way because my way is better, then then, uh, you're you're basically letting yourself down first and you're being a hypocrite. So the bottom line is we discriminate. I discriminate all the time. Even Even now I discriminate. So we need to have a very honest conversation with ourselves and with each other. And this is what we need to come across and say, look, at the end of it, we'll all die eventually. I mean, if you're a billionaire or a millionaire or a homeless person, we all die. And what works is, you know, I know if I can contribute to the collective in whichever way I can, I think, okay, I am serving a purpose. And that purpose is not defined by a God or anybody. It's self-defined. I've chosen that purpose. So in that case, if if let's say 40, 50% of the population start to do that, I think the society will change itself because we need to be honest with ourselves. We need to say, look, I think I can discriminate. It's simple. I think I can discriminate. I mean, you know, even if you create one society which has one religion, one race, all of that, you will still have subgrouping. That's the way human mind works. So what we need to do is celebrate the diversity. And I'll give you an example of nature. Nature could say, well, I've created trees, I've created ants. Why do I need to keep experimenting with millions of species? Nature is extremely diverse. But the good thing is we are so dependent on bees, for example, right? We are so dependent. I mean, when I was looking at grass, I realized if there was no grass, our, uh, we won't probably exist. If there were no trees, we will probably not exist. So nature is so diverse and the entire nature because the, it becomes the ecosystem. So we have to go back and say, okay, humans and humanity have to c- connect to uh, humanity. Exactly. That was my next point, spot on, and I'm so happy you mentioned it. My question was, okay, so we're talking about humans being human, and the other one is humanity. humanity. And one is the cognitive evolution, I would call it, um, of the other. So humanity here makes a difference. Does humanity mean I'm adding value with actions that I do, decisions, thoughts, or the way I generally behave? So it's a, it's, it's a bit of everything. I, I, I realized in my own journey, we need something to believe in. We need something to anchor ourselves. So that's why we love our culture. We love religion. Uh, and I think, you know what, when I replaced humanity with all of my culture, with everything, I, I feel I am less discriminatory. I feel I am a better person. I can genuinely feel that, that I'm a better person. So I do subscribe to the humanity as an idea. And that is what I am, I am now pushing myself. So, and humanity is an evolving idea. It yeah. always evolves. And if you could be from any background, and you could be from any nationality, any religion, it doesn't matter. But as long as you fully subscribe to the evolving idea of humanity, there is no conflict. Absolutely. And isn't that the real distinguisher here that we do actually have a little bit of, you know, our newest part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex that makes us different from 
all the other species that we can be conscious and not necessarily just driven by the older brains that are part of us and the emotions, but really kind of cognitively think about things and then do the actions. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, look, the, 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 I personally feel that we are nature's best experiment. I mean, I mean. Yeah, no, I, love I love that. I love that. You know, <laughs> your description of okay, what am I? I am live, so I'm experiment. <laughs> I'm an experiment. You said that. So you know, I, I genuinely feel that we are nature's best experiment, and we are in an experiment. And what we are doing now is we are carrying out our own experiment. And because we are carrying out our own experiment, we are creating climate problem, we are creating COVID issue, we are creating problem in our society. So there is an experiment going on and we are carrying that experiment. We are part of that experiment and we are inside an experiment. But I think, uh, I mean, again, I am not going that, you know, as humans, we are the best. But I do feel that we are probably the best thing that nature has come up with so far. I mean, yeah. that's my own opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we keep on evolving, that's for sure. Now, let's turn the page and, and look um, at truth. You mentioned that one. We have to be honest in truth. And that brings me to a chapter which uh, you call Dumbing Down of the Society. Let, let us not change the mirror. And there you're very hard on the media. And let me just read out a, a passage of that one for our viewers. And there you say, and to my surprise, I realized that a sizable percentage of people in the media are of below uh, average intelligence. Hence, they tend to have ego at least five times taller than their own physical height. This is probably a colorful and over-the-top statement, but hey, I'm willing to walk the statement back. Maybe I should, but let's probe it a bit more, shall we? Yes, we shall. Yeah. Now, you know, I've done some, in, uh, some work on it uh, because I let the opinion form and then I try to see, okay, am I just making that opinion up or there is a, be, there is a foundation now, if you look across journalists, and you must have come across, you know, somehow they, they move away from the business of informing uh, an audience, but they transform themselves in a business of teaching people, you know, preaching people. So it's on both sides. So on the conservative side, you have those type of people. On the less liberal side, you have those type of people. And there are no people who are saying, look, this is what I think. So you take a news information and what they are doing is creating their own interpretation of that news, creating an opinion. And that opinion is then get passed on to an audience as facts. And this is, this is the danger that we have created. So now we have a problem. Our society has no faith in the media. We have no faith in our system. We have no faith in our politicians. We have no faith in our agencies. And we have no faith in our neighbors. And this didn't happen on its own. We are all responsible for it. And I will blame a large part of it on the media and how it is informing our society. And I think we need to take a step back, do an introspection. And I will encourage our friends in the media, social media, and also the mainstream media uh, to have that introspection and say, you know what? Yes, I am pushing my personal agenda. I am pushing my personal opinion. And, and sometimes it's okay. I mean, sometimes it's okay uh, to think a bit more than you. Yeah, I think what you're saying has a lot of truth. Now, having worked in the media myself for a long time, you know, the fourth state, of course, is the information you were referring to at the beginning of your sentence, of your answer, is vital. I wonder, however, to what extent information really is transmitting a message if it's out of context. And what I've seen in good journalism, I don't want to talk about bad journalism, taking things out of context is bad journalism because it changes reality. But taking information, you need to have that context, that analysis by experts, not by the journalists. So good journalism, I think, uh, especially in the mainstream media, is where you have the piece of the information that is me, the news reader, reading it out, turning to you as the expert saying, so what do you make of it? And then it's up to you to push or not push your own agenda because whatever perspective you come from or thought or conviction you have will, of course, taint 
or just color whatever the interpretation of that information is. So being biased or trying to be a people pleaser or just trying to influence and manipulate people, isn't that part of the nature of the beast, let's say? Yeah, look, we grow up doing that. I mean, we, 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 our, you know, our parents manipulated us. We manipulate each other. I mean, we learn that in school as well. We learn that in in business. So, I mean, ex we exploit ourselves. I mean, we start learning to exploit ourselves first, and then we exploit each other, and we don't think about that. So, uh, the the unfortunate reality is we take that as for granted. We will exploit ourselves. It's, it's simple, you know. Is it really exploitation? And because I look at evolution, and if you think about who survives, which species survives, it is the ones that adapt, and it's the ones that are definitely the stronger, the better genes. So isn't really searching for collective and trying to get people on your side in order to be stronger something that is driven by nature, and we kind of can't help it to just go, hey, be on my side, because I know if I am in a group, I'm stronger, for example, be it with an idea or an action or some sort of evolution or revolution that I'm planning. You know, so my, my approach is now I don't massage the word. I don't look for a word that is more softer. I simply say, look, we will exploit each other. I mean, if I'm working with the team, I say, look, I will create a leverage for myself. You will create a leverage for yourself. We will exploit each other. And, you know, you can find a very softer terminology. And I can say, look, this is a part of our nature. And it is part of our nature. This is how we have succeeded. And this is a, a, a very mature discussion with people that, look, we have this inherent, inherent hardwired ability and capacity to exploit, create leverage for each other, for ourselves. And that's what we will do. Yeah. And I think that becomes the working assumption. So when you kind of under make people understand, people understand that you are being very upfront with them. So they will provide you honesty from their side. I volunteer 100% honesty. I volunteer 100% honesty. Uh, And sometimes you will get back those of that back in return. Sometimes you don't. So that's how I am approaching it. If I if I approach it that way, I think generally people do start to react and say, you know what, this is a different way of doing it. It's a bit more strong worded uh, things. But I think there is a realization, and you break the glass ceiling in a way, yep. and people do have a a different conversation with you. Yeah, I, I think. Be my experience. Yeah, I think I like the part of the honesty. Let's just be straight. Look, I'm here to exploit you. You're here to exploit me. But um, talking back uh, about the evolution, so yes, it might be semantic, Sanjay, but it might not be because exploitation is what we've seen so many generations, where we exploit nature, where we exploit labor, where we exploit, uh, you know, people that are just not as lucky as others in terms of where or how they were born in their social context. And I think we are moving more and more to a society that looks for mutual benefits mutual benefit. So I'm benefiting you, you're benefiting me, but at the same time, it's not a trade-off. It's not a win-lose, but it's a win-win, win-win-win-win. Maybe everybody wins a little less, but still we are enriching ourselves personally, hence the company, hence society, and hence potentially globally. Or am I wrong? So this is, this is why you need to have that honest discussion. You need to have a foundation. If you want to build a hundred stories skyscraper, you need to have a solid foundation. And solid foundation needs to start with very honest conversation. So when you get in a conversation where, you know, what we were referring to, people do start to think, oh, you know what? And I've had this real conversation with people. You know what? I do want to contribute. I do want to do something for the society because at the end of the day, man, I will die. And, you know, you want to take people in that direction, but you want people to go in that direction on their own. Yeah. And, you know, and this is what we have, uh, this, is, this is where I think if we don't soft, soft things and we just say, look, this is how it is, nature works like that. All the other species work like that. We have survived because of that. But we are nature's best experiment, so we need to do better than what we've been doing 100 years ago. So we need to not just take care of ourselves, but we need to learn to take care of nature. I mean, I, when I tell people, look, 
you know, your self-belief comes from your own previous experience. And I say, look, if you were to ask a God and say, look, God, what can I do for you? Uh, oh, no, 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 I don't think I can do that. Why, how can I help a God? I say, see, this is the issue, right? So the issue here is, you know, once we get into that honest conversation, you know, we, th- we know we can discuss anything without me and you or anybody else getting offended over something because they know we are having a very honest conversation. Honest conversation with we you. have all done that. We have exploited. I mean, there is a, there is a, there is this, in, in my other book, I wrote an idea, which is right to ownership. We came up with the right to ownership. We don't have a contract with the nature about owning lands or the trees or the water or the mineral resources. It's just that the other species couldn't speak our languages they don't have laws that we have, and we have a more powerful than them. So we said, you know what? We own the land. We own the water resources. And we don't have a contract with nature. So that is where I think, you know, exploitation is hardwired in us, unfortunately. Yeah, and that brings me to another part of your book called A Broken Human Makes for a Broken Society and Us Versus Them. I love those two chapters very much because it uh, speaks very much about the I, the me, myself, and I, and what is the I. But uh, it leads very nicely into the conversation where you say the idea of America, and you mentioned uh, in between the lines early on Trump and his ego and his egotism. And I wonder, what is... What is wrong with the American society? What is broken as far as you're concerned? 